webinar uh, arranged by Fest Fair. So we have slight changes in, in the program now. Uh, and I just want to uh, remind you that we are recording. So if you don't want to appear in the video, keep, please keep a low profile. Um, and uh, we were thinking of using the Q&A, but now, uh, yeah, I think we will do that. We will take the questions in the end. And, but you are, of course, also free to use the chat if you have, have any problems here. So, so my name is Jessica Parlanfonessen. I'm from CSC Finland and I'm in Finland and I'm working uh, also with the First Fair project. And with me, I have Rob Hooft. You want to say hi? <laughs> uh, yeah, Rob Hooft. Uh, welcome everybody as well. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, take just a quick look at the context here here's a short uh, program the content of this so i will first start with the introduction some background context on the first project and then i will talk about implementing persistent identifiers and then rob will will talk about semantic interoperability and metadata and we will also have a uh, some Mentimeter questions here in between. And of course, as mentioned, you're very welcome to use the, the Q&A functionality or the chat. Uh, I'm not sure the one who is speaking is able to follow these questions. So as mentioned, we will, we will look at those also then in the end. So first, some background on the quickly on the first fair project. Uh, the first FAIR project is an EOSC project, it's a three year uh, long project, and we are a bit past uh, mid term now. And here you can see the, the logos of the six main partners, core partners, but we have really a large large amount of, of uh, partners, also other other partners that we are working with that are participating. And then the idea is really to, to connect and, and, and facilitate this cooperation and, and discussion and taking their forward in the EOSC context. So the, the objective of, of this pro project is exactly this to, to so to bridge this different and facilitate uh, this EOSC, EOSC project and developments and, and promote the fair, fair activities in, in different ways that we identify uh, here. So some of the outputs from this document are and will be, uh, we have done a lot of reports already. There are very, very many deliverables in this project, <laughs> in my opinion. Uh, and many of them are like, I uh, thought of like um, some iterative uh, projects that we have like several versions of the same recommendation or, or they build upon each other in, in a way. So this is really uh, planned to engage as much discussion and, and like agile development and discussions and, and cooperation and engagement as much to take take this discussion forward. So there are <clears throat> our guidelines and recommendations around practices coming out of these works. Uh, the, this work like regarding the, the practices and the technical solutions. Then there is of course uh, a lot of work going on around data policy. So there will be and are uh, some recommendations and analysis on the practice have been done and then recommendations build on those uh, work with with um, repositories the support program for repositories to reach fair compliance and then work with certification building tools and support for developing work around fair fairness and and promoting fair principles we are quite heavily also relying on the turning fair into reality report and the recommendations 
that were given in that that document. And of course, the training, education, and support are really, really important. And we are doing a lot of cooperations, cooperation across across projects and and also with the universities and so so forth. So um, here's uh, just a quick peek at the structure of the project. So we have this um, work packages on fair practices and data policy and practice work packages two and three. Then is this uh, certification is, uh, things are, are managed in work package four. And then we have this uh, six and seven work packages six and seven are working with this. With, uh, promoting the skills and capacity like skills that and professionalization of of fair so that's some some um, words words on, on that sorry i have a <laughs> small problem with the uh, uh, managing the slides here so uh this seminar or webinar is, is then uh, produced by the work package two uh, which is called Fair Practices, Semantics, Interoper Interoperability and, and Services. So, um, and specifically, more specifically, Task 2.1, but in this package we are, we are working with, with the Fair Data Point and Technical Solutions Recommendations for, for Fair Semantics. This is just an example of some of the outputs. For instance, the uh, fair semantics there, we already have the second set of recommendations or the updated recommendations uh, out published in December. And now this uh, content we will be presenting today, these thoughts and, and uh, ideas we will be talking about are, are based on the second on fair requirements and persist for persistent and interoperability. So the key has been like to really uh, based on the survey we did uh, in the first report, we then wanted to to uh, now I'm stuck here. Speak. My cursor. No, sorry. Okay, I'm going to come to that slide. So the first report was a, was a review of the technical implementation of, fair, of the fair data principles. So we really did this quite extensive survey with interviews across ESFRIs and looked at, at things that that technical solutions and things that that are um, support fair fair data. The fair data principles and, and we wanted to like look at the commonalities and possible gaps uh, in this uh, uh, sense and then now this uh, second report is like more taking a bit step back and we try to look at the things that what we could could uh, go a bit delve a bit deeper into and how how we could like find the themes that would really uh, help promoting fair, fair solutions in a technical way. And now in this um, report, we have also decided to speak a bit differently with there are small sections to that are directed or like towards for specific groups, because we think that there is a really a difference uh, for whether you are a serv service provider or a researcher or a data manager, what you can do and what, what this is sort of your role in building fairness. So, uh, well, as you saw the themes actually we, we decided to, to discuss what you already saw in the outline of this presentation. It's, uh, and now we're talking not so much about, about like what's possibly, possible technically, but more about actual implementation and really with, but how, how you really in, in a service or, or as a research organization in a service, what does it actually mean if you want to implement these uh, things and how, how can you work uh, your way towards 
more fairness in, in, in choosing your implementations. So now uh, we should have a short Mentimeter survey here. Yeah, I will uh, switch. Okay, so if everyone uh, that is attending can already get a phone at hand or uh, a separate screen for a browser is also okay. Um, if you go to the website www.menti.com, you can enter a code there. If you use the code 78500006, which you can see on the top of the screen here as well, you can enter the Mentimeter and I see people are already entering answers, which is nice. <laughs> so uh, we'll give some time for people to, uh, to enter or to answer this question. So what are your expectations for this webinar? Uh, if you are logged in in the Menti, you can see the answers more clearly than uh, in this view on the screen. Um, so we're, uh, we're curious about uh, what you think. Uh, I see 15 people responded so far. Uh, let's wait for a couple of seconds to see if more people are responding. So far, it seems that most people are most interested in semantic interoperability and metadata. PRDs, data management and fair principles are less, but still relevant. And no one chose other yet. Okay, we have 18 participants now that uh, submitted answers. I think it's okay to go to the next question. Um, who is responsible for fair? Um, you can see this in your window. If you refresh, you can answer this question as well. Um, curious what you think, the researcher, data steward, service provider, infrastructure provider. You can answer it uh, with multiple answers. So if you want to select multiple answers, that's also possible. And we have already 18 people responding. So that's ah, 20 now. Uh, that's uh, interesting. Uh, more people are uh, choosing researcher, but maybe that's because some people might not knew already that they could choose multiple answers. Um, but still, uh, most people think uh, all of them are uh, responsible, which I think is uh, is a good response. Uh, we can go to the next question. What do you already know about this subject? Um, and with this subject, we mean uh, persistent identifiers, um, PID or so PIDs, uh, semantic interoperability, and metadata. You can refresh your screen again if you don't see the question in Mentimeter yet. And then you can answer it. And so basic understanding, metadata, PIDs. Okay. Basic understanding. I know fair principles and PDs for authors, organizations, data, software, research objects. Nice. Can you scroll down a little bit, uh, Rob? <laughs> it scrolls by itself. If oh, okay. okay. So I don't need to do anything. Oh, perfect. Specific metadata. Oh, that, uh, this looks good. 
I, th I think we can turn around uh, actually and become attendees and have the attendees present most of the yeah. slides. <laughs> yeah. Well, they say basic understanding, so uh, uh, no, hopefully not, they can still all. learn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then not all, not all, no. Yeah. Um, but it's uh, yeah, it, it looks nice. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this will be very helpful for us. Uh, 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 we will leave this question open because I think uh, now we can go back to the the presentation. Yeah, I yeah. need to figure out the the controls now, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Perfect. And Thank go you. Go back to the presentation. Thank you yeah. for presenting that part, uh, yeah. Sylvia. Uh, I'll uh, go back to the presentation mode for uh, the next part of the. Yeah. And I'll give back the control to Jessica. Thank you. So this was really, really good, good to see. And I, of course, one uh, important thing with this webinar also is that we are looking for the kind of feedback to take us forward towards the third and final report to, to get like um, comments and ideas for, for what would be most helpful for us to work with in the, in the final final third report that's upcoming. So I will now start first about and have a, a, some an excursion here on, on persistent identifiers and the implement persistent identifiers. And what we found or thoughts sort of developed on what we found in the, the first report, how we, we looked at this. I lose my cursor. Okay. Okay. So first, we of course went through a lot of definitions and uh, materials about persistent identifiers, and and there's really a lot, lot of material. Also, especially I think the basic. Uh, foundations or ground principles or something the document is mentioned that the uh, document that came out by with uh, with a compilation of different definitions by by RDA group or in conjunction to RDA um, so and I think that it's it's really important and to clarify and it's very good to to start trust try to have uh, even a common definition on, on what the persistent identifiers are and then also we we also think that there is that this is even not not enough but we need to like like make this uh, discussion even more nuanced but firstly the some basic uh things that we regard as people being quite much <laughs> aligned around these these requirements under this definition that the persistent identifier should be go globally unique, that they should really, really not be used to represent different things. And this means that they need to have a control syntax and a govern namespace, um, and that they should therefore be issued and managed by a clear, a clear, clearly specified registration authority. And now I know there are, other kinds of solutions also around, but we haven't taken them those into closer inspection yet. So I, and I also think that within the EOSC, my, uh, this is the like basic assumption that that we work, we will be working this way now for for a while, or this is the current state state of how PIDs are managed. Then the the, the other. Uh, criteria then would be that they are resolvable, that they really provide a way for both humans and machines to access to, to that you have a, a access to the digit, the thing that they represent or some information about it, the states of information, a landing page, they should be in some way machine actionable. Uh, and then that they should be persistent, that they should be representing the same thing forever, <laughs> uh, well, that's what's it agreed upon, that it should really be protected against content drift. And this should be transparent. And, and this 
of course, then means that this requires metadata and curation for the object itself and also the PID. So, okay. So, there's a lot of work ongoing within the EOSC and for this report uh, we didn't have time to, to include so, that's so much what was done in the PID architecture but the EOSC PID policy was, was included and within that uh, document there are some I think uh, seminal or good like definitions of the different concepts and roles that are involved in this uh, quite complex system that we have the, the PID authority and the schema that has to be managed and agreed upon, agreed upon. And then we have the PID service providers. And then we have the PID managers and owners, which can or can may not, maybe on the same, same um, instance or, and then the end user. So, and there is of course a connection between the responsibility of ensuring, for instance, uniqueness uh, and the syntax of the identifiers and how they are constructed. In practice, their responsibilities and governance can be delegated and shared in different ways, as I mentioned. So the most relevant thing is that there are policies in place and are agreements and it's clear and they are transparent and documented. So this is one really important thing that trust is an important part of the PID management. And there, there really needs to be this transparency and predictability in how things work over time. Um, and this, this trust has to be exist between all parties in the system. So um, also this uh, can, be, can be somehow reflected in, in how the PIDs are, what they look like and how they, they are structured. So there is this namespace that uh, is tied to the PID authority that sets the rules. Uh, an example of this could be like doi.org. And then there are the PID service providers that have the responsibility for, for issuing and for the resolution of PIDs according to the authority they rule under. So provision, integrity, reliability, scalability. Um, so one example could be as like data site. There could be other, other services like, like search. And then there is the PID owner who is the agent that technically can allocate PIDs and manages the kernel metadata and the registration and so forth. And then the PID manager, um, which can be like, um, for instance, a repository that sus subscribes to PID services in its operations. So the, yeah. Uh, the suffix then is also, I think, important to, to notice that that is really the responsibility of the, of the manager and owner that, that they are, uh, are unique and managed and aren't reused, especially this is important. And the suffix can either be the last part of the PID string can be either a hash or some other string without semantics, which is often was the smart and recommended uh, practice. And then in that case, it's called like, the, to, or it's usually said opaque, that it's opaque. So in the end, it's the responsibility of the PID owners and managers to plan their processes so that the suffix is unique and persistent. And there should be policies in place for this. So for the PID, system to work, uh, we need to be able to trust that something we identify as a PID really works. And we need to be able to identify it and, and then it really has to work. If this system is corrupted and this trust is corrupted, then this can lead to, to collapse. 
of the whole system and the idea of the PIDs. A published PID is really always a promise, and that means that some that it means something specific, and this meaning can be accessed. Uh, but even unpublished zombie PIDs create costs if you want to <laughs> ensure that they are not reused and they are un un unique. So even if it might look simple and cheap to create lots of PIDs, there is always sooner or later a cost if we, if we want to keep this system stable and in, in balance. So then some words about uh, resolving and what this means. There are different levels of or ways to, to do, do resolving. And now this comes from a Freya uh, deliverable, the, the sort of description of different kinds of, of PID resolution services and best practices. Uh, so there's the normal sort of domain name, domain name uh, service resolver, uh, which is just uh, and the and host name to the IP address. Then there are the local resolvers, which re redirect locally. Then you have the full resolver. And here we have the example is uh, handle. Could also be the URN, which redirects the URL to, to, uh, to another. Uh, landing page door to, to address. And then we have the meta resolver, which is only using a sort of pattern where we have this, like creating the, the, the on the fly, the, the address or the redirect uh, with the help of the suffix. And then we have the special case of the single service resolvers, where that's an example here is the ORCID, where we just have one ser service who, who aims to, to be a P. Then the most sustainable of these are the, the full resolver and the meta uh, resolver, as they provide this extra two tier resolver layer that creates a buffer against organizational and technical changes and can offer the robustness through networks. These are also called first and second pattern identifiers. The meta resolver is useful when there are existing identifiers that for some reason are both sensible, sustainable and useful to integrate as part of the suffix. And nesting and combining PIDs and identifiers are important methods to strengthen persistent and this is also discussed within the EOSC of the, this universal resolvers and the like. With, but I personally see there are some problems with that regarding the, can, the metadata and the schemas. So it, is, it will be interesting to see how this develops. So the EOSPID architecture is really, really interesting and it's really basically very good. Uh, so I want to make some comments on the semantics and the PIDs because <laughs> All PIDs actually contain some, some level of semantics because the PID in itself as a string contains information because it has to be recognizable. So you need to, whether we are talking about the human or machine uh, user, there needs to be some identifiable structure or, or part uh, that contains the information that this is a PID. And then, of course, then here to comment that all other semantics poses a risk that that should be really, really carefully thought about if, if you want to add some some other information in the string, like uh, time stamp or something. Versioning or such, they, they can create problems. Um, then the PID uh, record contains the kernel metadata. Of course, you know, if you want to have a resolvable PID, you need to have the URL where it points. But there is also other kinds of, of important the metadata, like maybe who owns it or when it was created or such. Um, and then there is this all other kind of metadata, which is then uh, not supposed to be stored in the PID record, but elsewhere. Sort of the master metadata about the object itself is somewhere else. Uh, or at least it's the authoritative 
metadata should be somewhere else. And this should be also very clear so that we don't get conflicts about which is the correct information. So um, we found that there are really uh, two kinds of use cases or different approaches which are interlaced and connected, of course, but many times it seems that the discussion and use of PIDs becomes uh, difficult because people come from very different uh, approaches and use cases, and it would be beneficial, uh, I think at least personally, if we could uh, always try to, to think about which is the, then the primary use case we are discussing. We have the research information context where we are talking now about the PID graphs that are are created and when we want to link uh, different kinds of, of outputs and resources and results and persons and and which this is really important of course for the visibility and also for how to, to find and discover uh, things but not only not only individual resources but only also patterns and impact and, and all these kinds of things so this is one one use case, I think, where we operate with this uh, big, big, big graphs. And then we have the other context that some people are working very closely with the research and the research process and the research data life cycle and thinking about what things do I need to, to link to my, to my data? Do I need to link sensors? Uh, what's the data versions and uh, instruments and algorithms and code and not all of this maybe needs to be published or go into the research information graphs maybe it does but but still somehow the context is much more specific and the designated community can be smaller it can be the only one researcher <laughs> even that needs to manage manage the process to create this reusability and transparent and well documented data data and, and research and of course these are linked and i see that often the data stewards and the data manager they are exactly standing here in the middle of the line <laughs> so their um, task is many times to help the researcher uh, who's working with his own uh, process to find this connection where they can link where there are the identifiers that they can can maybe benefit from using and then creating more interoperable things. So as mentioned, this is not, uh, this is a very much simplified and of course reality is not like this and data flows back and forth, but, but uh, somehow it would maybe ease the discussion about the ideas from time to time and especially the implementation if we can keep these use cases sort of separate. And then there is also the question about the depth, uh, how far do we really need to go uh, in the machine actionability? Um, it is actually not always necessary, it's smart. Uh, the cost benefit is not maybe good. It's not feasible to try to go to the deepest fare. Um, and sometimes it is. So this is also the, something that was very obvious, obvious, I think, from the material we come that some fields are very mature and it's possible to, to have a very, uh, very machine actionable and, and very good, uh, clear, uh, coherent, simple and ambiguous structures that you, but then you also need to manage all this, all parts of it, uh, like <laughs> forever. <laughs> And so this is, is not feasible and not smart to do always. Okay, so it's actually uh, about striking this balance, I think many times uh, uh, between the, the needs of the designated community and the interoperability across domains. Uh, we need to think about the, the ontology, um, the, there are things like the granularity and the, in the research process, what needs to be described, what needs to be captured, 
what's the structure actually what are we talking about instrument variables measurements and relations between all these things so how how many pids do we do need and how how we do we link them and and also then of course from this designated community use case looking across uh, domains and see where we can create interoperability with the PIDs. Then there's the question of life cycle. How persistent is the data object? And the, uh, and the question of reproducibility, how well, uh, how, what is the culture and requirement for persistence and documentation in the designated community? which is also important. And then the different use cases that you will need to think about. Actually, what are the needs? And if we talk about citation, there are, of course, uh, these uh, evolving data sets for which there are good suggestions and solutions from, from the RDA working group on evolving data sets, site citation, and, and you can build these systems and they already exist and are in use in some places. And there are examples of good, good practice here, but this is in some cases then quite um, a big system to build for a small, small, or if you are doing a small project or a small research data set or research data and also here you need to think about the sustainability if you have a, a small research project or a, re a limited research project that that has funding already, already say for four years uh, can you be able to how will you solve this after the project funding ends what will you do with the database and all the pids and the citations out there so so this is um you need to think about the feasibility here. And here I would like to shortly present something that's actually not a direct output from first fair and this report, but something that we did in the Finnish open science coordination work where we had some experts uh, discussing uh, stepping stones and a guide, like guidelines for actually implementing persistent identifiers from the organizational point of view. Because despite uh, the comment that um, we saw in the Mentimeter that researchers really need to take their responsibility, researchers shouldn't be PID owners. They shouldn't be um, minting them on their own and they even can't. It's always related or should be connected to bigger, to, there should be an organizational background and service who can really ensure the sustainability and persistence over time. So the role of the organizations uh, and service providers is really crucial, but this is quite a difficult field as it is so quickly growing and we also didn't have these different use cases and contexts. So we wanted to make some kind of guidelines <clears throat> for research organizations. So firstly, we recommend that you do a landscape analysis. You need to look at what you have, what object you need to identify and identify the relevant practices, standards and regulations. What are actually, there might be laws, standards you need to take into account and requirements. Uh, you need to map the external information. Are uh, you linked to, let's say, open air? Uh, data site, what, what is expected and needed regarding these things, and also analyze the current state and the target state of your own organization regarding the whole information management. What's, uh, where are you at and what capabilities do you have and what, where are you going and where do you want to be actually in, the, in this uh, aspect. So then the second step is to comparing the alternative and then you need to assess the different PID systems that are available and PID services, schemas, and which type for each type of object you need to think about what would be the correct or, or good, good solution. Uh, compare costs. There are always costs. Even if you put up your own handle server, you need to, you need to maintain it and keep it running and updated and so forth and plan for the life cycle and then assess the trustworthiness of the different solutions. And then the third step is then deployment and maintenance. 
And there we want to underline the importance of creating these uh, common rules and guidelines and documentation about what the IDs you use, how you use them, and who allocates what, and all, all this needs to be documented. And then you need to also train train your personnel and under users so that they can use them in good ways. Okay. So in conclusion here, um, for service providers, uh, what they could do for promoting fair, they can they can provide this by by like writing a good and implementing a clear PID policy. What PID is for, for which kind of, um, the things I mentioned before? How do you use which PIDs and who owns them and so forth? Uh, versioning everything. Uh, then of course actively promoting and taking part in PID governance. And this I think is important because you, to be able to assess and have insight to how trustworthy and uh, function, how, what the development, which ways they are taking, you need to, to take part and at least follow, follow what is happening in the field so that you are aware and aren't, aren't taken by surprise then if there comes some changes. Uh, so also, if you realize or identify that you have uh, relevant master data, then assign the IDs and open them and share them. Um, integrate external PIDs in your information architecture, in your planning. Uh, don't, don't create <laughs> PIDs if the PIDs, if things have PIDs, use the external PIDs. Um, if you have have a trustworthy uh, uh, provider, and also then try to internal in, integrate these external PIDs in the workflow of metadata creation in all steps, so that they, all users are always offered <laughs> offered the possibility to enter ORCIDs or whatever PIDs, and then. Uh, of course, automating the processes of metadata generation, generation and linking, linking as much as possible in a user-friendly, transparent way so that the user still can see what's happening and understand and uh, then doesn't make maybe the error, errors there or wrong, create wrong links. So just my final slide here on PIDs. PID is a promise, especially a published, published PID so remember, remember this. <laughs> I hope that you you agree on this. And now I will hand over, I think, to Rob. Yes. Well, I will uh, take back the control over the screen. So uh, let's see. Stop the remote control. And uh, yes, uh, let me uh, also. Sorry for the interruptions. Make sure that I can properly. Present this to you. There we go. So semantic interoperability. And uh, the, the first slide that we have here is uh, showing that semantic interoperability is actually uh, a, a part of a whole stack that is needed to make interoperability possible. There, uh, this is a, an image from the European interoperability framework, uh, mostly targeted at uh, public services, uh, communities, countries, uh, governments uh, who are sharing their data, but it's a very good model to see what kind of interoperability is needed. And you see it four layers here. So there's built on technical interoperability, semantic interoperability, organizational interoperability, and legal interoperability. And it's important that uh, you have technical interoperability so that the, the systems actually physically can connect and, uh, and uh, uh, transfer the data between them. Uh, 
uh, the semantic interoperability then deals with understanding, but uh, that only works if the organizations that create the data actually understand each other. And also uh, it only works if the legal interoperability is, uh, is, is met. So if for instance, licenses are uh, properly compatible between different organizations. A nice organ uh, organizational interoperability uh, example is in the COVID-19 uh, era, of course, uh, where we see that for instance, between Belgium and the Netherlands, it's very hard to compare the number of people that died from the disease because the number of people that died is measured in a different way. That's, a, that's an organizational thing. It's a, organized in a different way. The, the value may be the same, but it means something different anyway. Just at the, at the edge of semantic and organizational interoperability. And uh, yeah, to, in order to make something machine uh, readable, machine actionable, interoperable, you need to uh, have all these uh, uh, layers in place. So uh, this is a, a link to a video. We will make the slides available for you. And uh, if you haven't seen this video, then it is really worth seeing because it shows everything that can go, can go wrong in the interoperability between two uh, researchers. Uh, this is uh, about a series of misunderstandings and incomplete descriptions that then uh, make it impossible for uh, somebody else to reuse the data set. And actually even by the same group where it was originally assembled. So I won't be showing it here, but uh, uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, then go and, and look it up. So what the first thing actually that I see very often in data management plan uh, templates uh, about interoperability is uh, that there is a question about what the file format is. And I, uh, I think actually that the file formats are part of the technical interoperability. So the technical, the, the, the semantic interoperability is not solved by the file format. In addition, many file formats that may be interoperable are uh, technically interoperable are actually making some interoperability very hard. So let me suggest a PDF. PDF is actually an output format and is very hard to reuse. So it's very, uh, very bad for uh, FAIR. Uh, similarly, actually, in a lot of uh, data management plans, I see that people are asking for or are providing CSV files or SPSS files in the hope that those are very, very interoperable. And yes, maybe those formats are very interoperable and frequently used, but actually they don't solve the interoperability problem because they don't completely define what is inside. They are so flexible, you can put anything inside. So what do we need next to the file format? Actually, we need all the content of the, uh, of the, uh, the data also to be unambiguous. So what does that mean to have all the content into, uh, uh, unambiguous? Well, uh, the first thing is the terminology. So if two people are talking about a plant, then uh, one person can mean a factory when he means that, and the other one can understand a biological plant, something that grows in a forest, uh, and uh, they maybe even think that they understand each other if they don't ask further. And that is really dangerous. So they actually are misunderstanding each other, but they think they are talking the same language. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that not only all the terms must be unambiguous, but the numbers that are in there are also uh, unambiguous. So uh, an, another example, so if two people are talking about a temperature of 32 and they're coming from uh, the US and from Europe, then they may, uh, may be talking about a temperature of 32 and in Europe, we think that it is very hot outside and in the US, they think it's very cold outside. So all the uh, every mention of a temperature should make need a unit in order to be really interoperable. So uh, a, a third thing that really needs to be the, uh, present if you want to make sure that uh, that you're interoperable is uh, that you know what it means when the data is not there. Uh, there are often very often there are special meanings to empty strings, empty values, zero values, or even negative values, and uh, it basically you really have to make sure that it cannot be misunderstood but okay if we say 
not possible to misunderstand by whom are we talking? Well, it shouldn't be possible to misunderstand by any user of the data. And user of the data can actually range from quite uh, close by to you to quite far away. I, you could be uh, talking to your own, uh, your own self uh, right now or in five years. Do you still remember what you were, what you meant tomorrow, or in five years when you're re-looking at the at your data set, or a coworker? Would a coworker understand exactly the same thing? And if you really talk about uh, interoperability uh, between uh, research subjects, then it is uh, uh, also necessary that people in another lab, maybe working on completely different science, really will need to understand your data to do this kind of wide scale data integration. And whenever you go down that list, the number of uh, possible misunderstandings go up. So I come back to this slide, but now not with the unit in mind, but uh, if one of these two is actually a doctor and the other one is a, uh, a meteorologist, then both may be talking about temperature, but they mean completely different temperatures. And even if both are doctors and they both are talking about the body temperature, then it is also essential that it's being measured in the same way because otherwise the details may be different. So that was the definition of the problem of semantic interoperability. And then the next question is, how do we actually go and solve that? Uh, the uh, FAIR principles are only principles. They don't actually point at solutions. But uh, in fact, the people that have written those uh, FAIR principles, they did uh, see the example of linked data. Linked data uh, and its standards are very good technical implementation of, uh, of semantic interoperability. Um, and it's based on the fact that all data can be described in the form of relationships and properties, that you don't just use terms and then misunderstand terms uh, in, in two ways. Either you use a different term for the same thing or you use the same term for two different things, but in linked data, you use URIs and you make sure that everybody understands the same URI in the same way. And it is also highly generic. So many tools are working with any kind of linked data. And so we can really benefit from the multiplication of, of uh, purposes. So this is an example of uh, relationships and properties that can be represented in linked data. So we see the relationship between Alice and Bob um, and we and, and relationship between Alice and uh, parents and Bob and his parents. Uh, but we also see the relationship between uh, or the, the, the property of Bob that is his birth date. So uh, here you see uh, properties and relationships given as arrows. Each arrow connects two things and in uh, linked data, the thing that originates from the, the arrow is called the subject. The uh, destination of the arrow is called the, uh, the object and the arrow itself is called the predicate. So we have triples of subject, predicate and object. All these uh, boxes are called concepts and the relationships are, as I already said, triplets. And, and uh, the idea actually is that any kind of knowledge that we have as human beings can be represented in such graphs. They become uh, quite uh, complex, but uh, they, these graphs can represent anything we know. And uh, what can be on the edges and on the boxes, we can put in, in lists, and those lists we call ontologies or more generally, generally semantic artifacts. They describe what can be in each box and what can be on the edges and what kind of boxes can be connected. So if you compare that to a table of data, then uh, a, a table, uh, in, in, in a table, it doesn't only describe what is in each row in each column and what are the values, but also explicitly all relationships between the columns. So an, uh, an example of a 
table that is not completely well defined, maybe a table in a hospital that uh, has as a first column a patient identifier, the second column the disease that the patient has, and in the third column medication that the patient takes. For a human being reading such a, a table, it is obvious that that patient is taking that medication to treat this disease. But this information is not explicit and therefore a computer wouldn't know it. If you would represent the whole table in triples, you would make all of these relationships uh, explicit. So you would also have an arrow from the disease to the cure uh, uh, saying that this disease is cured or is attempted to be cured by this uh, medication. So that. Uh, when human beings read that table, they use the tacit knowledge that they have, but that tacit knowledge is not available in other people or in machines and limits the interoperability. So I said that there was a whole stack of, uh, of uh, technologies and uh, standards and software that uh, supports linked data. So this is the stack very well based with the URIs that I mentioned as the, uh, instead of terms that is at the bottom of the stack, they, they uh, resolve normally to a human readable page explaining each of the concepts and everything that you see in this whole stack of technologies is reusable for in principle all RDF data. Now there is one uh, issue and that is that uh, linked data is often called unstructured. So it's schemaless. You don't actually have to think about the structure of your data before you start uh, making it. Uh, and uh, this is then contrasted to a table where it is, uh, you, you structure the table even when it's empty and then you start filling it, uh, but only when the structure is completely clear. Unfortunately, uh, obviously, if we want to avoid ambiguity, then all the data also in linked data must be strictly described. Uh, uh, in a table, so if you query a table, then it's obvious you, you already know the structure of the data. But if you query this graph of linked data, then that is not, not uh, arranged. So before you query linked data, you need to know its structure too. Uh, and one of the, sta the standards recently added to this stack of, uh, of, sta of technologies is called Shackle uh, that actually describes what kind of relationships you will be able to expect in the data. And it can also be used to verify whether any data set actually satisfies these uh, constraints. Um, another thing, and that is uh, related to what uh, Jessica told you, uh, it is not always smart to go very deep. So it is definitely possible to uh, uh, make a whole JPEG image or TIFF image into RDF by describing the properties of each pixel. Uh, so uh, every pixel has an X coordinate, has a Y coordinate, has a red, a green, a blue, maybe a transparency. This is horrible and very inefficient, and it doesn't help you with interoperability at all. So please don't convert all the data to uh, RDF, but if you make sure that you can, could theoretically uh, convert it to RDF uh, unambiguously and automate it, then it is probably uh, a good data format. So you don't need to convert it to RDF. You can use tables, you can use uh, all, any kind of other data that is efficient for your analysis. But if it can be transformed into an RDF-like scheduled schema, then it is uh, probably very uh, uh, interoperable. Now, what we are building this way is uh, sometimes called, uh, recently called fair digital objects. Fair digital objects should be machine readable, but you need to do a lot of things to actually make sure this is, uh, this is working. Uh, this is an image from the EOSC interoperability framework, which is also uh, partly based on the same four layer uh, model. And uh, it, it is, uh, uh, you see a layered ball that describes the different layers of, uh, of data interoperability there. Each of the, uh, the terminologies, the ontologies needs to, uh, uh, to be well-defined, needs to have rich relationships in order for the interoperability to be really uh, valuable. And these uh, semantic artifacts where these ontologies, they need to be fair themselves. And this is also one of the fair principles actually. 
And uh, the data managers and the data stewards can actually really help the researchers in finding, developing these kind of artifacts. And uh, the service providers can uh, help to make these ones findable and, and support data managers and stewards in, in using them. So in summary then, uh, rather than describing a term to describe something specific to a human language and context dependence, refer, we refer to concepts by a, a unique identifier. In standard linked data, this is a URI, but we can also use a persistent identifier for that. Each data value must be having a precise data type and documented so that misunderstandings are impossible. We use semantic artifacts to do that and sharing and curating these, these ones to be fair and trustworthy is the basis for sustainable semantic interoperability. There is another uh, uh, task in Work Package 2 of Fair's Fair, who is uh, developing these kind of standards. So if you follow the recommendations for Fair Semantics, uh, currently version uh, two in uh, deliverable 2.5, then you're on a good track. And uh, service providers can really help here. Service providers can be providing and implementing a clear data management policy, actively promote the development of semantic artifacts and tools. They can uh, create, curate, and link the semantic artifacts and, uh, and share them. They can integrate external semantic artifacts in the information architecture integrate semantic artifacts in the workflow of uh, metadata creation and uh, automate the process of metadata generation using shared and controlled vocabularies. So this is the, uh, the end of the part on uh, semantic interoperability. Um, uh, Jessica, do you have any, any additions on this uh, section? Because it's also your uh, specialty here. No, I think it. I think you covered it <laughs> nicely. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that the one important point here is really that if we really want to have semantic interoperability, we need to share these uh, objects <laughs> and and the semantic artifacts. If everybody just creates their own and never uses other ones, then then there isn't really you can't be sure whether they are the same or different. And and so this is really important to be looking like around and finding other others common shared cement tools for for this kind of creating yeah. of, uh, data sets or graphs okay thank, thank you for that addition is a good uh, good uh, uh, point also indeed uh, so uh, I sometimes say to uh, uh, medical researchers, it's obvious for a doctor to look up a, uh, the cancer type that they are dealing with in an ontology and actually give that cancer type in, a, in, in their data. But it's less common for a doctor to actually look up the place where the patient was born or where the patient is living uh, in, uh, in a, a geographical form and store that the same way as a, ge a geographer would store a location on Earth. However, if we ever want to couple a medical database and a geography database, it is important that we're using the same standards, even if it's not our own field. So yes, this is it. sharing is important for interoperability, sharing between inside the field and between the fields. OK, so uh, Please post any questions in the Q&A and we'll come to that at the end. Uh, I will now uh, progress to the uh, part on metadata. So the first thing with uh, metadata is always that uh, it makes me think of this quote by uh, actress uh, Jane, Jean Harlow, uh, who said, uh, don't give me books for Christmas, I already have a book. And actually the, the same translation into, into data would be, don't ask for metadata, my data set already has metadata, which is what a lot of people actually think is sufficient, but it isn't. And if you look at the FAIR principles, and this is just a, 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 a quick reinterpretation of the FAIR principles, I highlighted all of the 
places where metadata is mentioned. And of course, in some places it's data and metadata. So the meta is between brackets and in other places it is a metadata completely as a word. So you see that there are lots of places but they're not where, where metadata is mentioned, but not all of these copies of the word metadata are talking about the same metadata. So uh, if you look at data management plan uh, questionnaires, then often one of the questions again is which metadata standards will you use? And, and luckily it is standards with an S, uh, but the options that people get to answer this are often, I will use Dublin Core or I will use discipline specific standards. Neither on themselves are sufficient. You always need both to do that. So uh, Dublin Core data site, they are generic data set, uh, data, uh, data set uh, metadata. They can always be used to describe any kind of object, but uh, you cannot say everything with those generic metadata. So you always need discipline specific standards as well. So now if we look at the uh, individual ones, uh, then I've put some arrows at ones that are uh, especially important. So uh, F4, metadata are registered or indexed in a searchable resource. So what are, is that searchable resource used for? It is used to find data back, find data sets that are used uh, that are usable for a certain uh, new piece of research. So it's important that that metadata includes not only the author name and the title, but actually what is in that data. Uh, so a medical doctor may be wanting to look for patient data that includes body mass index, or uh, if you look for in the data set of uh, uh, all the COVID-19 data that are now hosted by open air, you may want, if you are a, a traffic uh, a researcher, you may want to look for the plane diversions, which is a data set that is given there. So you need to go, be able to get information about what type of data is in there, what kind of fields are in there and what, what, uh, yeah, what it is. Um, then if we go to interoperable, then we have the formal, accessible, shared and broadly applicable language for knowledge representation and the vocabularies that uh, follow fair principles. That's actually what I talked about in the semantic interoperability. So those uh, uh, descriptions of the data fields and their relationships, they are the metadata that is necessary for interoperability. It's different metadata than the metadata for findability. And similarly, for reusability, there's yet another type of uh, metadata. Uh, so there it is important that not only humans, but also machines know what can be done with the data set. So it needs to have data users license that is clear and understandable, machine uh, readable, hopefully. And it needs to be clear what the day, where the data comes from. So there's data, met metadata for findability, for interoperability, and for reusability. So R1.3 actually, metadata meets domain-specific community standards, explicitly mentions the domain. And if you want to look for such standards, then you look for things that are called minimal information standards, MI or MIA standards. There's, uh, their abbreviation start with often. And the data stewards and data experts really need to build those together. And if they exist, reuse them as we've seen in the interoperability part. So again, what is then in a metadata standard? Well, uh, the metadata itself, the metadata standard itself can define in what format it should be, but that's less important. What is more important is what kind of metadata is actually given. Uh, so that's fields. Each field, of course, needs a definition, a human readable definition, and we need to actually make sure that the machines that read the metadata understand it. And then often you have priorities, so they have metadata that are obligatory, recommended, or optional. And my, my warning is always that oh, it's op optional because some in some cases they may not apply. Um, it's not optional that you can just leave it out if you feel about leaving it out. The, uh, the reuse of data often really benefits from having 
uh, as much metadata as possible. And an example of that, again, from the medical field, sorry, that's why I uh, work with uh, people a lot. Um, so the, the uh, optional, if you have a patient population and the average uh, age is uh, 45 years, then you can write, of course, that the data is, that, that the average age is 45 years. But in order to calculate this average age, you had an age distribution. And for the reuse, this age distribution distribution may be very, very useful. So don't throw it away. If you have it anyway, just add it to this, uh, to the metadata, uh, if possible. Now, and then uh, the, the third part of the uh, metadata standard is, of course, that each of the fields has a vocabulary where you can choose the terms from. Uh, or an ontology, even better. Uh, so each of the terms or each of the, the components of the metadata actually is well-defined. So how to find the metadata standard? Uh, there are repositories for metadata standards like fair sharing and the RDA metadata directory for which there are links here. CDAR is the metadata center in the, uh, in the US and it is uh, not only a repository of these uh, standards but also a very convenient way of building them together in a community. Uh, similarly, the component metadata infrastructure is, uh, is a European uh, uh, definition. It, it has metadata standards, but it also defines uh, very good ways on how to build those. And a similar slide as uh, in the earlier sections, how service providers can support the metadata, you will recognize that most of it is very similar to the semantic interoperability here. Of course, a metadata policy is separate, but uh, this is also uh, very important. But the rest is identical to the uh, semantic interoperability. And with that, uh, I, this is the end of the uh, metadata section. So uh, now we are going back to the Mentimeter. So allow me to uh, flip a little bit on the slides again. And uh, let's get my browser to the second part. Okay, so we are back at the Mentimeter and we're uh, back at Sylvia and yeah, I will switch can... to the next question. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. So this question, you can refresh the browser uh, when you were using uh, Mentimeter before, just refresh. If you see the question, you can answer. This question is also uh, multiple answers possible. So uh, take that into account when answering. And then we'll see what uh, the attendees think. See if everyone is getting along with the Mentimeter. Are people having problems with uh, getting the question in front of them? Because I see 14 people responding now and before we had more people. Yeah, there are 22 uh, attendees, but uh, yeah. maybe we have to give people a little bit more time yeah. to get back into the Mentimeter. Yeah. So still uh, nice to see that no one chose other. <laughs> Well, they know that they that we would be uh, asking them in and uh, having yeah. them explain, of course. <laughs> what do you think about the results, uh, Jessica and Rob, so far? <laughs> yeah, I, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, I think it's often about striking the balance, and I think you need to be able to, I mean, for instance, if you really want to, uh, to also support reproducibility, you need to be looking at the designated community and support your, <laughs> your uh, domain needs uh, firstly, but then try to 
as much as possible link them to others so yeah yeah so it's in the end it's always both i guess mm. uh we can i think we can go to the next question rob okay i'll uh, move on um, so this is about uh, uh, the next report that we will write. Uh, Jessica introduced it already in the presentation earlier. Uh, we would like to know uh, what you think are main focus points. Um, you can uh, skip answers, uh, skip uh, 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 if you don't want to answer them all, you can skip a, a couple. Um, in the next question, uh, there's an open textbox. So um, if a topic that you, that's not here, um, then you can answer that in the, in the next question. So we'll see. I see also a response uh, of Arena in the chat stating that uh, metadata for findability are important across discipline, but reusability perhaps enough in your broader discipline. Yeah, that's a good addition. So there seems uh, a lot of support for uh, the three uh, topics on top. And then also a little bit more support for semantic interoperability and metadata as compared to uh, PIDs. But I guess that's probably because uh, most people in, the, in this group uh, uh, explain to already know about the PIDs. Yeah, I think so too. And it's, it's not that it's a partly specific. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I'm I'm looking ahead also at the Q and A, and I see from uh, Tommy there is also a question uh, indicating that there is just a need for more explanation on uh, on semantic interoperability. What we yeah. had here was really the prerequisites, the preconditions, and uh, I agree fully. We we probably will need to do more uh, on uh, on explaining that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think we can uh, go to the next uh, question. No more answers are coming in. Okay. So which unanswered questions are you left with? Um, yeah, no, we, will so have, yeah. we have some time for you to answer this. Uh, in the meantime, I think uh, it's probably a good idea to address the, the questions in the Q and A that are unanswered. Um, yeah. So, um, Jessica and Rob, can you? Yeah, uh, the first one is for Rob from Berg. Yeah. Uh, question, can you explain again the specifics of the data object? How exactly the data objects will increase interoperability? Yeah, so uh, fair, the fair digital objects are uh, uh, worthy of uh, their own uh, webinar in incompleteness. And uh, I think actually there are some uh, good recordings of uh, Luis Bonino uh, explaining uh, fair digital objects. And uh, this is coming from Bert Meerman, of course, he works for the uh, GoFair Foundation. I know him very well. Uh, <laughs> and Go GoFair has been working on the, this uh, a lot uh, together with, uh, with RDA. Um, there is still, uh, the definition of fair digital objects is still going on but it is really uh, in the, uh, the paradigm of the hourglass that was used also to define the internet. Uh, TCP and IP, the, the basic protocols of the internet are in the, the waste of the hourglass. They're a very small thing, but that small definition, if everybody agrees to it, allows everybody, all the computers of the, on the internet to interoperate at the technical level. At the same time for in semantic interoperability, the fair digital objects want to do the same thing. So they want to be a very small standard that defines how uh, digital objects are connected together and how to find them. And this includes 
persistent identifiers. This includes the definition of what kind of metadata there is, all the relationships between the data and the metadata, and actually stacks of metadata, because each metadata object is in itself a digital object, which has its PID, its metadata again. So those relationships are very well described in the fair digital object. And uh, if we do it well, then we can be with the definition of the fair digital object, we can really help the world forward like TCP IP did and like uh, HTML and HTTP did for, uh, for their respective interoperabilities. So I hope that answers uh, Bert's uh, uh, question. Okay, and then the next, yeah, maybe Bert, can you uh, let us know if, if your on, or your question is answered uh, correctly in this way or enough for you in this way in the chat? Otherwise we can uh, go to the next question. Yeah. Which is for Jessica, yeah? Yes. Uh, oh, I'm I'm not sure I can answer this. <laughs> can you read it? Uh, yes, you can. Well, I look up the data type and types and data values of PIDs. So I think this is actually more a question that for that we are maybe lacking semantic artifacts or lookup services for this kinds of uh, shared values. Of course, there are ones like uh, the love. LLV, uh, but but uh, I'm not actually working in practice with with research data currently, so I uh, I don't have these examples. But I think this would be, I think personally, an important for, uh, like thing for the EOSC to provide this really support to to find and share this kind of of research resources. Well, I don't know. Maybe Rob, do you have? No, <laughs> can't do it better. <laughs> um, yeah. So there, there are some services, and of course the Bartok uh, service for semantic artifacts. There are some, uh, or lots of, <laughs> but not all of them are fair. So they don't provide necessarily unique identifiers or feeds. Yeah. yeah. So there, there are uh, data type registry developments, mm -hmm. but it's it's not yet complete. The, those standards are still under development. Yeah. And what I fear mostly is that people just upload their own existing identifiers to these registries, so they don't really advance interoperability. Mm. Yeah. So that's, yeah, the, that's really the, bad. bad. This, this is indeed a story that I uh, heard uh, happening in linguistics, where uh, they had a repository of, uh, of concepts and definitions, uh, but it didn't uh, in the end help the interoperability because everybody uh, uploaded their own definitions and then started using their own definitions. Mm. Okay, so that's an incomplete answer for uh, Mateusz, but uh, yeah, yeah, I hope it's all, it's all we can do, I think. Yeah, it would be interesting uh, to hear if you have some, some further or own thoughts on this, Mateusz, I don't know. Yeah, we, prob probably Rita could uh, draw uh, Mateusz in, can give him uh, access to the microphone. Yes, I can. If you want to. Oh, um. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh... Then, yeah. Now. Yeah. Please. Yes. No. My... Yeah. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for for giving me the voice. <laughs> now, so uh, my worry is so so I really like the example with the medical doctor and uh, and the geograph. So the problem is that. Uh, 
whenever we, we, we store any data, then these values or the data types are, are usually invented by our own. So I, I come from computer science domain from databases. And this is also a problem in our field. So whenever we have data, this then uh, they represent something else or they are very customized for the, for the purpose. Now, if I suddenly store a table with, with, with uh, names of the cities, I would like these names of the cities be interoperable such that someone else who searches for data that consisted names of the cities or cities themselves can, can, can use it. So how to do that? And I think that this is a big problem and this is a big issue. So, so in my experience, I, I, I don't really know from my experience where to find this kind of identifiers. And that was the background so, of my question. Yeah. I, I think the uh, generic answer to this is called mapping. So uh, if, if two people have different ways of representing the same uh, kinds of things, then uh, you can uh, create a mapping between those two. And this that for identifiers, identifier mapping uh, is, is one possibility. Of course, geographical coordinates, it, this is also well worked out and it's actually, uh, there are services that will map geographical coordinates to city names and the other way around. So, so those things are, are solved. But there are also very uh, uh, other very complicated ways. Uh, there are uh, in uh, biology uh, seemingly trivial things like matchings between genes and proteins, which should be a one on one, but it isn't exactly. Uh, there in chemistry, there are relationships between uh, molecules and substructures of molecules and those kind of things are also mappings and they're really complicated services for that but all of them have the basis that you uh, put an identifier in and you get an identifier out it is not just not always an identity mapping it can also be another kind of mapping that goes on in between Okay, so, so thank you very much. Yeah, another example would be Im uh, object recognition on the images, right? So if I store images for, for whatever reason and someone else stores for experiment purposes images for another reason, I would like, for example, to connect based on what objects are on these particular images. Uh, now, yeah, this is, I think, a general problem of how to name things, right? <laughs> Yeah. So uh, there, uh, if they are objects, then probably there are object uh, ontologies to actually describe them. Uh, so those those things definitely exist. There are ontologies for very, very many uh, things already defined. So it's always worth having a look at them. Mm -hmm. There are br brilliant ontologies for dates, for for time uh, uh, time intervals, relationships between time intervals, all, all those things have been worked out and they are really uh, helping interoperability between different fields like anything in science and uh, even gene genealogy, uh, family research. So yes, these things exist uh, and it's definitely worth looking up uh, and reusing what exists, not only for interoperability, but also because maybe it looks simple to do, but these kind of things, building these kind of things in a reusable fashion is really hard. So, so yeah. maybe, that, maybe that's an idea to actually bring together at least sources of the, uh, these ontologies uh, for the basic data types, like, like objects, names, CDs, yeah. you know, things that commonly appear in the, in the data sets. Because yeah, that would definitely. be very useful. Yeah. 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 I, I, I maybe want to just comment that we are we are soon running out of time, I think. And I I was thinking also looking at this Tommy's following comment or question about the maintain maintenance of semantic relations. That this is also I think a challenge. That this would be really nice to have all these things, but they really need to be maintained. And as the wor world keeps changing, <laughs> uh, reality changes, so the ontology changes, and we need to keep these like reliable so we don't have these problems then when, when using old, old stuff. So when you use external uh, PIDs or artifacts, you really need to be able to trust them in the long run also that there are somebody's looking after them and they won't break. <laughs> 
So, so it's uh, there's always, I think, this like question of feasibility and cost that we need to. I would like to ask Rob now to go to the next question. We have had some uh, good unanswered questions, but which we will take forward to our next uh, uh, report. And the last question is to evaluate um, the, fo the following statements. You can see them in your, on your phone or in your browser. If you click refresh again, you will get the, the question. Yeah, and, and while we are answering, I might maybe promote the next webinar. We will having, be having a uh, similar webinar uh, on February 4th. But that will be directed more towards researchers. So we will be having a slightly different approach. So if you want to promote that webinar, maybe Rita, do you have the link? Uh, so yeah. we could put it maybe in the chat. So yeah. if you want to promote this, that to some, some somebody, a researcher close to you, please feel free. Yeah, it's going to be on the 1st of February at the same time at 1. PM European Central Time Zone. Um, yes. The web page is now on the chat. Feel free to register. Thank you, Rita. And of course, uh, you are very, very welcome to give feedback on the deliverable and, and be in touch in, with any ideas or, or thoughts you have on, on how we could, could uh, produce. Uh, a really useful deliverable <laughs> for you. And thank you for participating and uh, attending. Yes, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, well, yeah, thank you very much, and hope to see you uh, in the next uh, in, in a few weeks' time. <laughs> yeah. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.